Joining us on the Thursday edition of the broadcast, a lot we're going to cover on the show. As you know, if you watch this program, we try to take storylines from Central Virginia and relay them to you wherever you get your social media or podcasting content. We localize, humanize, and personalize the region through the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, we try to highlight positive, and we try to highlight the raw and real. It's topic matter that should matter to you. Um, a lot I want to cover on the broadcast today. If you want to see today's talking points or the subject matter of the program, look at the screen. We'll talk Louisa County. Um, clearly, Louisa County is on a path of, of, of economic um, opportunity. Clearly, Louisa County is on a path of, of significantly more housing. Clearly, Louisa County is on a path of a larger population. And we still don't know the true impact of what $11 billion from Amazon is going to have on Louisa County. This jurisdiction is prime to boom. In fact, we've predicted on this program that Louisa County will be the next Crozet. If you look at Louisa today, you see elements of what Crozet was 20 years ago. And if I was a board of supervisor in Louisa County, I would look at the blueprint of Crozet and say, what can we take? And what should we emulate? And what should we absolutely distance ourselves from? What should we make sure does not become a reality? Utilize Crozet as a blueprint. I say to our uh, six-year-old son often, hey, son, try to copy dad's good habits. And please ignore and disregard your dad's bad habits. Um, and for the most part, he does that. There are times when I look at him and he does something and I'm like, how do you get angry at a six-year-old when you did the exact same thing earlier that day or earlier that week? Um, still, you have to correct them um, and say, look, that's wrong. And then his response, because he's a pretty sharp cookie, is, but dad, you've done it. And at that point, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and realize, hey, being a dad carries a lot of responsibility. <laughs> um, and I need to become the best version of myself if I want our oldest son to be the best version of himself. Um, a lot we're going to cover on the program, including the economic impact analysis of Virginia distilleries. There's a report that's out that has gauged that economic impact at a pretty startling number. That number took me aback. In 2022 alone, the economic impact for Virginia distilleries was 1.1 billion, billion with a B, across the Commonwealth of Virginia, with roughly 80 licensed distilleries as of 2022. Hmm. There's more since 2022. Yeah. We have a number of distilleries that are around here, including one directly behind us on the downtown mall. It said Vitae Spirits, Judah Wickhauer? Vitae Spirits, yeah. V Vitae Spirits, owned by Stefan Friedman, the man that owns Ace Biscuit and Barbecue, Draft Tap Room, mm. Bonnie and Reed, Vitae Spirits. I believe he purchased Licking Hole Creek Brewery. He's combining Vitae Spirits and Bonnie and Reed, where folks waiting to eat at the seafood restaurant in the downtown mall with the big fish on the window. Yeah. They're going to be able to enjoy spirits at Vitae, Vitae uh, while waiting for their table at Bonnie and Reed. He's also filed for some permitting that allows him to have food at Vitae Spirits. The previous owner, the founder, who took the brand very far. He's come on our show before. Yeah, he's been in here a bunch of times. What, remind me of his name. He was kind of... Ian enough. Glomsky. Go on a studio camera. Ian Glomsky is his name? You have a photo of Ian? Uh, yeah. Uh, let me just get... Uh... Ian Glomsky, the owner of Vitae Spirits, the founder. I mean, he hooked it up. He hooked the bar up no with um, a barreled collab. Oh, wow. This barreled collab was done with Champion Brewing Company. Is this a collector's item now? Could be. A barreled collab done with Champion Brewing Company in my hand. Right here, Ian Glomsky. He, I believe he was a chemist or a scientist. Studio oh, yeah. cam just showed Definitely. Lloyd Snook going by right there. You might not be able to catch him. Uh, a 
is it Damson? Yeah, Damson. Damson. Damn, son. Is that how I say it? Oh, I got to be the best version of myself. <laughs> Copy my good habits, son. Damn, son. Or is it Damson? There's, there's another one for you. Damson. Yeah. It's a gin. He hooked us up with, uh, this modern gin was delicious. It was a breath of fresh air. Hmm. It's modern gin. And then he hooked us up with a maple syrup barrel finished rum. So four bottles and a couple of flasks from Ian Glomsky. Um, Stefan Friedman purchased Vitae Spirits from Mr. Glomsky and is now looking to revitalize the brand. He has promised he will shift his attention next to Draft Tap Room. We're all very excited about that. We'll talk about the, the economic impact of distilleries, and I will ask this question. Would we see a world where distilleries supersede breweries and or vineyards when it comes to economic impact in the Commonwealth or in Central Virginia? You might find my answer surprising. We'll talk about youth resource officers. I initially was wondering, are these teenagers That's or children thought. that the police department are going to train <laughs> to serve as junior officers in schools? And Judah was quick to correct me and say, no, 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 Jerry. These are actually police officers trained to interact with youth. And these youth, I mean, they're basically creating a new brand here. The school resource officer SRO um, brand or moniker has got some negative connotations, whether justified or unfairly labeled. SRO has negative justification, negative connotations. Yeah. So they've created a new brand, and the new moniker is Youth Resource Officer. Yeah. This Youth Resource Officer, very close to being positioned at Charlottesville High School. And where else, Judah B. Wickhauer, J-Dubs? Uh, uh, sort of the B. Burley. Burnley, I yeah. threw you softball. And, the, and at uh, after-school activities. Yeah. Um, like sporting events. This seems like a slam dunk, guys. I'm, s I'm so ready to put this story behind us. Many in the Charlottesville Teacher Union are vehemently opposed to officers in schools, whether school resource officers, whether youth resource officers, or whether policemen, whatever you want to call them. And they're quick to point out the pipeline to prison and students that are often historically marginalized coming in the crossfire of said officers in the hallways. I am quick to point out this. The teachers and the parents are begging for the officers in the schools, the large majority of them. Let's get them back in there and let's return to safety in our public schools in Charlottesville. We'll talk about that on today's program. I also want to highlight um, the clearing of the Preston Avenue Bridge. I want to be clear here. Our sources have indicated that this is not the Charlottesville Police Department that cleared the Preston Avenue houseless encampment. If you ever are on Preston Avenue and you drive under the bridge, under the overhead, the, I mean, you got a railroad right there, Judah. Yeah. The, this is railroad police that are doing the clearing, not local PD, but police associated with the railroad. Many folks don't realize that the railroad has police they employ. And they spent um, a day and change last week clearing the homeless encampment under the Preston Avenue Bridge. And there were a lot of people living there because it was an opportunity to get out of inclement weather. It offered shelter. I get our cars serviced at... Um... Settle. Thank you, Judah. You're a good man. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. I was having a senior moment over it there. It happens to both of us. Yeah. Have you seen your moments? I'm having senior moments right now. What the hell? Um, I get our cars uh, serviced at Settle. And when I'm not asking kindly Judah to drive me to settle to pick up the company vehicle, I will drop off the company vehicle at 7 a.m. and walk to work from Preston to our studio on Market Street. It's a nice walk. I mean, it's like less than, it's basically a mile. Uh, and I go under this bridge. It was absolutely disgusting. 
There was so much trash there. It stank of urine and feces. There was obvious signs of human feces. (laughs) There was steel reserve, Colt 45, and malt liquor bottles everywhere. I hate to say this. I saw used syringes on the ground. Mm -hmm. I saw used... Should I just stop right there? We'll stop Uh, right there. I think we can guess. I think you guys can utilize your imagination. What other used items we found there? Something that's perhaps even grosser than a used syringe. Yeah. We'll leave it right there. And the railroad police cleared the encampment, which I was, was... I think it was CPD. I'm pretty sure it was not. I'm, I mean, I'm looking... The, based on the, the CBS 19 article... Uh, In fact, there's a thread CPD on Reddit about this. Contacted... There's a thread on Reddit about this that shows the photo of the police clearing the encampment. And one of the officers supervising the workers that were doing the clearing was not in CPD gear. Okay. But you can offer some perspective here. You know, there's a bit of market confusion. What was the CBS 19 story, my friend? Uh, the, the story goes by this by this article that uh, CPD contacted Norfolk Southern Railway right uh, and informed them about the encampment uh, Norfolk Southern cuz Norfolk Southern owns it yep told CPD they did not want anyone under the bridge okay. for safety reasons and requested that everything be re- be removed and uh, here's a quote from uh, police chief conscious oh we did the George go- Clooney of policing We did go up there several weeks ago and gave notice and talked to folks. And from what I understand, they all left. But there was a lot of stuff under there that needed to be cleaned out. So that's what they are doing today. So you could say, yes, they're throwing away all these people's stuff. But if they left it there, I mean, what do you you want them to do? And it's not their property. Yeah. The railroad owns the property. And if the people, well, again, if the people left their stuff, then what do you want to do? Do you want to take it to a lost and found? Do you want to uh, contact the people? A and lost say, and found? I'm, I'm being facetious. But I, how would that work? Exactly. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Because if you leave stuff lying around, don't expect to, to have it not get... Taken and thrown away. Whether it's the railway, the railway that did the supervising, Norfolk Southern, and the railway police, or it was CPD, there's folks in the community that are reprimanding or throwing their hands in the air and saying, again, with this. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if their narrative is that the police came in, manhandled the people and that is the narrative kick them out that is and, the narrative that's and, what they're trying to position bingo and then just threw away all of their stuff which sounds like either ignorance or a patented lie I or know, exactly because that exactly. doesn't say unless you know obviously we have to take somebody's word for things but uh i'm sorry but i'm going to take uh police chief conscious's word that uh, they talked to the folks and the folks cleared out And anything that was left there, not taken with the people, was cleaned up. A man of reason, Judah Wickhauer. A man of reason. Very well said. Um, Thank you for that analysis. Also on the program, we'll talk the tensions at Monticello. Judah. Thomas Jefferson's old stomping grounds is... Beverly Hills 90210. It's crazy. We just need some Steve Sanders, some, some, some Dylan McKay, Brandon Walsh, Brenda Walsh, Kelly Taylor, and, 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 and Donna. Was Brian Austin Green's character? What was Brian Austin Green's character's name? You're asking the wrong person. You weren't a 90210 fan? My sisters were. God, I love 90210. How did you not like 90210? I mean, I occasionally watched it, but I don't have like an encyclopedic memory of all David the Silver and Andrea Zuckerberg. Yeah, okay. I mean, we 
<laughs> David was rendezvousing with with Donna, with with Kelly, with Brenda, Dylan, and Brandon were rendezvousing with everybody. I mean, what the hell is going on at Monticello? Not so much rendezvous, but drama nevertheless. Massive drama. It seems to revolve... Backstabbing everywhere. I mean, it seems to revolve around the new president. But they've lost another... Uh, I mean, the, they lost the guy that was in contention, uh, in comp- competition over the... I think both would work. Over the presidency of, of, the, of the foundation. And uh, it's very strange. I mean, apparently he offered to leave early after after he was not after the other. Uh, is it Kaspersky? Uh, <laughs> Kamens- Dylan, Dylan McKay. Kamensky is the name of uh, of the current president. David and, Silver. And after winning, uh, the other uh, Andrea Zuckerberg. Cogliano. Zuckerman offered. Zuckerman. Uh, who Damn cares? <laughs> Okay. Do we want? To, do you want to talk about? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. No? I'm just trying to add a little flair. I apologize. You're 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 100 right to stick to the script. My apologies. Okay. You keep going. I'm sorry. After Kamensky was voted into the seat as president and Cagliano lost, he offered to leave early. To which the new president said, "No, no. We want you to stay stay around." Then it seems like there was just some petty stuff going on. And his his term ends in, I believe, the end of June. And so he's like, you know what? I'm out. Apparently, he actually moved to Virginia from, uh, from Edinburgh. Specifically to, you know, to, to help out here. And uh, he's leaving. There are other people that, uh, that are leaving. And it's just... Uh, Albert Graves, mess. thank you for the retweet. We appreciate you. Uh, thank you kindly for watching the show. Um, you handled that well. John Blair, hello. Deep Throat, we're going to get to your comments in a matter of moments. Bill McChesney, one of the key members of the family, asked about the Mickey Tavern deal with Monticello purchasing Mickey Tavern. That deal fell through. Yeah. When you have absolute turmoil and uncertainty at the top of the professional totem pole, you're not buying uh, restaurants yeah. like Mickey Tavern. You're, you're trying to do a little deal flow instead of adding to your uh, responsibility plate. Yeah. And the most concerning aspect of that was that they were going to outsource the day-to-day operations in the food and beverage management to a hospitality group out of Pennsylvania. Exactly. Let's represent Thomas Jefferson. Let's create a nonprofit and represent Thomas Jefferson and all his holdings and do it the TJ way by outsourcing day-to-day operations and food and beverage management to a company in Pennsylvania. I mean, it could be argued that it's apropos that, uh, that they would outsource considering uh, Thomas Jefferson's history, but we don't really want to get into that, do we? <laughs> I, we don't have enough time for that. <laughs> Judah, B. Wickhauer, good night. It's not wrong. Louisa County, Crozet, where do you want to go? This is the comparison. And help me work with me with the comparison. Louisa County today is what Crozet was 20 years ago. Yeah. Louisa County today is still a relatively sleepy county. It's got an area that's prime for commerce in Zion's Crossroads. Just like uh, Crozet's got an area that was prime for commerce, you could have pointed perhaps to downtown or the future development around Old Trail. It's got a golf course community, Louisa County, called Spring Creek. Crozet's got a golf course community called Old Trail. Louisa County has schools that I've been here 24 years, and right now, the Louisa County school system is bona fide. Bona fide. It's a school system that is conservative in its ideology. It's a school system that makes it about education and not politics. It's a school system that is about 
empowerment with parents and communicating with parents. It's a school system that got online first in Central Virginia during the pandemic. Said, we're going to return to teaching our kids the normal way in a classroom. Screw these screens, get the kids back in the classroom. It's got a fantastic superintendent in Doug Straley, who at one time was the athletic director at Louise County High School. It's got economic activity all over Zion's Crossroads. When you have a Walmart and a Lowe's and a distribution center as your hubs because of the proximity to the interstate for transportation, mm -hmm. you are going to have other businesses ride the coattails of major fortune what are Lowe's and Walmart? Fortune 100, Fortune 50 brands? When Fortune 50, Fortune 100 brands like Walmart and Lowe's say, we're going to open up a location here, they don't do that kind of opening of locations without thorough research. Mm -hmm. And their thorough research indicates an economic, economic opportunity. So there you see a number of other businesses riding the coattails of Lowe's and Walmart. You got the fantastic Mexican restaurant, El Mariachi, with one of its co-owners watching the program right now and Johnny Ornalis. No doubt. You got an ABC store. You got a Chinese food restaurant. There you go. Got to have that ABC store. <laughs> you got a Rets. Who's going to move there? There's no, 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 ABC no ABC store. store. I ain't moving there. That's one of the tough parts of going to Keswick, living in Keswick, where we do. Better question. How you want to get some bourbon? Where do you go? You have to drive 15 minutes to go to the ABC store. Mm. What are yep. the reasons we're moving across town? It's not because of the ABC store, sweetheart. She's better question right is, how do you have a, a, a golf course community without a nearby ABC store? You have one in Keswick, where I live right now. Yeah, but you've at least got one in town. What, Pantops? Talking 15-minute ride. What about... 16, it, 17 minutes. Is that the closest one? Yeah. Base of Pantops. Food Lion From, Shopping Center. Okay. That's the closest one. Jeff Leonard right there walking by. Good man. Got a fresh haircut, Jeff Leonard. Um, we just got a lot of things going for it. And we haven't even talked about $11 billion with a B coming from Amazon. We've been told by people who know 800 to 1,200 direct and indirect jobs coming thanks to the Amazon investment. We also know that Spring Creek has 600 to 700 lots still to be developed. So you have a gated community in Spring Creek. The infrastructure, the golf infrastructure, was just purchased by a Northern Virginia golf club. Heritage Golf Club bought Spring Creek Golf Club. So now you have an out-of-market business that bought the Spring Creek Golf Club, Heritage. And they're going to run it like they run their 32 or 33 other holdings as experts in this line of work that use trial and error tactics from their other holdings, successes and failures from their other holdings to make Spring Creek as good as possible. They're raising dues. They're raising initiation fees. If you want to become a member of Spring Creek, you better do it sooner than later or you're going to get stung with an initiation fee that's much higher and monthly dues that are much higher the longer they own this club. It's a bona fide club. It's a bona fide golf course. So here's what you got. A school system that's pretty damn good right now. One of the most influential companies in the world about to invest $11 billion for multiple data center campuses. You got local government that understands the concept of economic activity and how to generate it or spur it, create it. You're right next to the interstate. You're in the middle of Charlottesville and Richmond from an employment standpoint. So if someone works in Richmond or someone works in Charlottesville, Louise is right in the middle. Doesn't take that long to get to either. you got housing that still for now is relatively affordable. You have all the makings of a success story. Just like Crozet had 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Crozet had all these, <laughs> not $11 billion from Amazon, but had all these other elements, interstate access, had larger employers at the time, had Old Trail coming on market with a bunch of lots, had the Western Almoro school system that's legit, it's bona fide. Folks call Western Almoro High School Stab West. John Blair pointed out that the tennis team at Western Almoro High School is, is playing boarding schools and private schools across the Commonwealth. The tennis team at Western is playing private schools across the Commonwealth. $60,000, $70,000 a year private schools. 
So if you're the board of supervisors, how do you make sure this does not happen? The pitfalls. And how do you make sure this does happen? The successes. Comments are coming in on this topic. I think as... Oh, Judith's got a first comment. Go ahead. I like that. I think, I think they need to work with the surrounding, surrounding areas, cities, counties. Um, I, I, think, I feel like uh, a lot of the problems we have, like in Charlottesville, is obviously we need to expand, right? But you can't expand, and I think that's going to happen anywhere. I think we're going to end up with, you know, eventually... Any area with the you know the potential that Crozet had, the potential that Louisa has, is going to need to expand. And you're either going to fill every available you know square inch of space of, of land that you've got, which in a lot of ways is what Crozet has done. Yeah, or you're going to find a way. Many to, would say to the detriment of Crozet. Yeah, because eventually you're going to need to expand past your borders. Look at like Los Angeles is not just one sprawling giant city it's northridge it's uh you know it's south central it's all these different places that all fit together uh maybe not well or in uh in a a very uh, organized way but it's you know it's one big place that's made up of a lot of smaller places and you find that in a lot of areas like new york is not just like New York, it's Manhattan, it's Queens, it's all these little spaces that work together somehow. And I think that's what some of these places need to think about is you're going to need to expand. Like Charlottesville, people obviously don't all just live in Charlottesville and work here. We've got people from, you know, all over the place, from, uh, you know, from Waynesboro and Crozet to like further out. So they need to consider that in their planning stage and hopefully, uh, you know, plan for the eventual expansion outside their borders. Judah Wickhauer. God, would you, would you have to, what's in your coffee? You don't drink coffee. You, you, had, you had some smart juice per usual this morning. Well, very well done. Deep Throat, number one in the family. Viewers and listeners, you can see where you stack up in the power pole by visiting ilovesevil.com forward slash viewer rankings. Number one's watching the show. Number two's watching the show. First, go to Deep Throat. Guess what he says? What can Louisa learn from Crozet? Master planning. Mm. I lived in Irvine, California, which had a 50-year master plan for growth and infrastructure, nice. Deep Throat says. It really works. What do you get when you do not do master planning? The city of Charlottesville, <laughs> Deep Throat says. Yeah. Deep Throat also says, impose level of service standards on developers. Mm-hmm. Well-designed rubrics to analyze impacts of new developments and impact fees assessed on those development to cover the capital costs imposed by the new developments. Rubrics. That's good. Yeah. Good commentary right there. Definitely. Um, If I was Louise, I would prioritize schools quickly. If you're looking at the Western Almaro school system, you've got to realize that we have a crowding issue. And if I was Louise, the County Board of Supervisors, I would prioritize infrastructure and roads. Mm. Because when you're looking at Crozet, you clearly see an issue with traffic and congestion, especially with one of its two main arteries gets uh, throttled or clogged up with an accident, either the interstate or 250. Yeah, no doubt. So those are where you need to start. I would also do, um, I would also manage growth, residential growth strategically. Mm. Louise is in a very advantageous position in that it has economic development, business opportunity, so revenue can come into the county that's associated with business. Business revenue, business right. taxes. So you're not revenue just relying coming, on, on rooftops. You're just not relying on rooftops. One of the difficult aspects of Crozet, while it does have strong employers, and was it Music Today's out there, the fantastic pro Renata's out there with Dr. John Shave, it does not have the employment base that Louise is going to have over the grand scheme of things. And because that employment base is not there, they need, you got to figure out ways to generate some revenue. You also have, uh, you also have a lot of your citizenry working outside of of your area, uh, which means that uh, oftentimes they're also going to be shopping outside of your area 
as they, you know, before they return home. Um, Andre Xavier, that's so true. Kids watch us. They don't listen. My kids generally don't listen either. <laughs> they certainly watch us. Um, appreciate you, Andre Xavier. All right, so let's close the first topic as you're putting lower thirds on screen. You put me back on screen on a one shot. We'll highlight Otto Turkish Street Food on Water Street as a partner of the show. If you need a lunch or dinner suggestion, Otto Turkish Street Food on Water Street is dynamite. Give them a try. I'll close this first topic about Louisa um, by saying, look at what Crozet's done well and look at what Crozet's done poorly. And that could be your blueprint to expand and grow your county. Uh, I want to get Fitzgerald Barnes, who's a friend of the program, the former athletic director at Monticello High School, board of supervisor at Louisa County, and one of the guys that was very influential, whether he knows this or not, and he does know, know this, of me launching uh, my business um, 16 years ago in six days. Six days from now, I've been self-employed for 16 consecutive years. And Mr. Fitzgerald Barnes had a big influence in uh, encouraging me to launch 16 years ago. All right, let's talk about the economic impact. No, no, no. First, I need to get to John Blair. John Blair's comment's a very good one. If you get Mr. Blair's photo on screen, that would be good. He says, Jerry, one of the biggest distinguishing factors between Louisa and Crozet is county land use policies and the presence of millionaires and billionaires. Almaro has very restrictive land use policies. It also has an enormous amount of millionaires and billionaires in Ivy and Western Almaro with huge estates. These people do not want any development around them. Thus, Almaro County land use policies funneled all of the growth in the western part of the county into Crozet. Louisa does not have the policies nor the millionaires and billionaires. This development will be very different. Hmm. Fantastic commentary. You drive down Ivy Road. I make this day, drive on a regular basis. And if you're driving down Ivy Road from the city of Charlottesville into Crozet, where you have um, Borshead and Greencroft on your left, I want you to drive down Ivy Road and see the significant amount of acreage and land owned by a few people that will not be developed. Significant acreage. And he's right, that development is being pushed, if not ramrodded, into Crozet. And you have this pocket from the Charlottesville city line to the Crozet to the Y, or 240 and 250 split. What is that, where the uh, Mexican restaurant is? Hmm. Where the old Ivy Roadhouse is? And that stretch of land is, for the most part, just God's green earth without hmm. housing. Next topic, the economic impact of Virginia distilleries. This is very interesting. The Virginia distilleries in 2022, all the distilleries, these are spirits, this is liquor. In 2022, it was a $1.1 billion economic impact. $1.1 billion in 2022. There's just 80 of them. Now, Deep Throat has highlighted this. $1.1 billion, he says, is not a ton. He says... In Virginia, the GDP is $600 billion, 600. But why I think this is worth of, of significance is the following reasons. The distillery business in the Commonwealth is very young. Yeah. It's not rich or deep in tradition. This is not Kentucky, where this has right. been going on for centuries. We're not already oversaturated with, uh, with we distilleries. We have 80 of them. There's 80 of them, ladies and gentlemen, distilleries, okay? And 80 of them are having a $1.2 billion impact in the Commonwealth. There was a distillery in, I read this today. There was a, a spirits distillery in Ivy that just sold. Let me see if I can find it. And this spirits distillery in Ivy that just sold, I literally read this today. See if you can find it prides itself in being in an organic distillery. And this spirits distillery in Ivy just sold to the longest running black owned uh, distillery in America. See if you can find mm. that story for me. I've got one here, a vodka based uh, vodka company based in Ivy, Virginia. That's the one. Square One Organic Spirits. Bingo. 
created in August of 2004. Tell me that story. Uh, let's see. Recently it's sold to the largest black-owned spirit company in the world. There it is. Uh, first 20 year company old company. Dedicated to producing exclusively USDA certified organic spirits. Uh, first organic rye vodka brand. After 20 years, the brand will now be run by Uncle Nearest, based in Tennessee. There it is. We have an industry that is so young, so young, that has eclipsed the billion dollar impact. We just had a distillery in Ivy Road exit to the largest black-owned distillery in the world. Mm -hmm. Spirits maker in the world, right? Yeah. The beer makers, that category is saturated. Mm -hmm. Wineries, vineyards, you can make an argument that category is saturated. You know what's keeping the wineries and vineyards cash flow positive? It's the events. The wine is the cachet to have your wedding at that location. Yeah. Everyone wants to get married at a winery or vineyard. Mm -hmm. What separates a winery or vineyard from the local community town hall? They make wine there. The wine is a marketing play, a branding mechanism for events, which is the true revenue stream. I would say that the, that the wine making is, is almost more like personal pet projects for yeah, a lot of these Yeah, it's a passion people. project. And then the, uh, the... The events are what keeps them afloat and yeah. allows them to pursue the passion project. Right. You have saturation in vineyards. You have saturation mm -hmm. in breweries. You don't have saturation in distilleries. And the consumer, especially the younger consumer, is showing indications of, of uh, seltzers and tonics. Now, what's the, what's the White Claw called? It's a seltzer. Yeah. So seltzer. Seltzer and spirits. So I see upside with the distilleries. I would bet you when you look at the economic impact of distilleries, the 1.2, 1.1 billion, 1.2 billion, according to this report, is going to get even higher in 2023. This report, it was a study done uh, by the Virginia Spirits Board. The release says Virginia's distilleries generated more than 275 uh, million in revenue across all channels and activities, and paying workers more than 139 million in wages. Unbelievable! All right, I got a 145. I got to be mindful of. What's the next headline? Um, let's see. Seville Public Schools and the Youth Resource Officers. All right, I can I can button this one up quickly. Whether you call them school resource officers, whether you call them police officers in schools, or you call them youth resource officers, get an officer in the schools. Yeah. Get an officer in the schools. Take that burden off the teacher's backs. Please, dear God. Read what's Kurt's book? Uh, the Miseducation of an American Teacher. Schooled, yeah. Okay. Kurt R. Johnson? Yes. Right? Yeah. Read his book. One year at Charlottesville High School. We had him on the show last week. It was a startling look at Charlottesville High School. Bill Moon Catchy's come on this program. Mm -hmm. He says get the teacher, the, the police officers in the schools. I understand that some in the teacher union are saying don't do it. Really? The union president, Matthew Gillikin and Shannon Gillikin, very influential in this community. Shannon is the president of the teacher union. She's opposed to this. She's a kindergarten teacher. Hmm. Matthew also opposed to this. Does he teach? I mean, I, not, to, and not to throw shade, but I mean, if, well, of course you don't need, you don't need resource officers for, uh, for kindergarten. Elementary school doesn't need the resource officers. The they middle school need and the high school does. Yeah. And... Your largest aggregation of students is at after-school activities like football games and sporting events. Yeah. Get them there, too. Yeah. This is called common sense. We're going to have to save some of these storylines for tomorrow. What else is on the docket? Uh, Give them a tease for tomorrow. Also got... Uh, the here. Preston Avenue Bridge Encampment. I mean, madre. I think we covered that really well. You can't have a dozen houseless individuals drinking malt liquor... Peeing, pooping, shooting up, and doing what else under a bridge on Preston Avenue? 
Lighting fires? Legitimately having campfires under a bridge. Yeah. Shooting junk, doing uh, bumping uglies, pounding Colt 45 and steel reserve, and sleeping under the bridge. That done work. You can't do it. Yeah, and for anyone wanting to blame the police, I mean... Give me a break. It's... Asinine. It's the... Ludicrous. It's the prop... The property is owned by... The railroad. Yeah. And they asked that, uh, that the people be removed. Thank you. Thank you. That's the story. Go after the, rail, the railway company. Manipulate it if you want, but the story is that, what Judah just said. We'll talk about Monticello tomorrow. We have uh, uh, Dylan McKay, Steve Sanders, Brandon Walsh, Kelly Taylor at Monticello and it ain't getting prettier. Mm. And I think somewhere TJ's rolling in his grave. Judah Wickhauer, Jerry Miller, The I Love Seville Show. So long.